Um, this is week 13, uh, AP2 lab, and this is about the renal system. Um, so the renal system, generally speaking, um, this is just an introduction and uh, the general function of the kidneys. The one thing that we all know is that it filters out or it gets rid of or it remove the waste products and the toxins. This is one of the, of the functions, but it, the most important is homeostasis. Homeostasis is to maintain the composition and to maintain everything on the, of the body fluid, basically. Composition, pH, volume, everything should be contained within the normal range. So the urinary system participates in homeostasis. Beside the regular function that we all know, uh, which is whatever we get rid in the urine, like uh, metabolic waste products, um, anything that's excess, not necessarily waste product, even if we have something that's not a waste, but we have it in excess, we will get rid of it. Uh, something like um, hydrogen, we need hydrogen, but if it's too much, we get rid of it. Um, something like even nutrients, if you have too much glucose, it will start to show up in the urine because it's excess. So you get rid of whatever is not supposed to be there, whether it's not supposed to be there at all, or it's not supposed to be in excess. So the urinary system, generally speaking, consists of the following organs. Kidneys, obviously we have two kidneys, and this is what filtrate the blood until it makes the urine. And the urine is going to move through the next organs. So you have two kidneys, two ureters, and the ureters will take the urine from the kidneys to the bladder. In the bladder, it's, go it's going to be stored temporarily. So it's collected, stored temporarily, the urine, um, until it's, it is uh, full or, or close to be full and it's, it is the good time to go to the bathroom, this is what we're going to void. Uh, void means micturate or urinate. All three have the same function, uh, have the same meaning. And then the urethra is going to take that urine from the bladder to the outside. The kidney, it's just important to know that it is located r uh, uh, behind the peritoneum, which we call it retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal. Retro means behind, peritoneal means the peritoneum, which is the serous membrane that's surrounding the vast majority of the abdominal pelvic organs. Uh, there are some exceptions, the kidneys are um, uh, some of these exceptions. Uh, to stay in place, the kidney is surrounded by two extra layers. Those two extra layers do not count toward the structure of the kidney. So if you say the kidney, uh, the outermost layer of the kidney is the renal capsule. However, there are two extra layers that does not count toward the, um, the parts or the layers of the kidney, but it is something additional that's outside. And this is a connective tissue called renal fascia and a depose tissue or fat that's called the renal fat. So if you go to the uh, kidney structure, here is the kidney. This is the whole thing right here. And there are different ways to divide the kidney or to talk about the kidney. You can go layer by layer. So this is, if, if, if that's the case, this brown outermost one here would be the renal capsule. Uh, next, this one here would be the renal cortex. We will go to the details, but I'm talking about the whole thing. So this whole layer here, right under the renal capsule, is called the cortex. This layer here, that contain these pyramids, as you see here, the brown, and you see like an alternation, like pyramids and this light colored parts, which is called the column, and then pyramid, and then column, and then pyramid, and then column, and so on. But you're going to call all of this layer together, you call it uh, the renal medulla. And then any spaces in here together, we, we, we call it the renal sinus. The renal sinus is basically all these spaces but it's more important to know the different parts, um, uh, I mean the different structures, structure by structure. Layers is what we did right now, but we're going to go in more details. So if you go to the details, this is the section, like you're taking a section right here and right here, and you're taking this wedge or triangular shape part and you take it out here, uh, we call this the renal lobe, and the renal lobe contain a lot of structures um, 
these structures are called the nephron. Here is one nephron here that we take it out of this. So inside, insides, uh, this is the kidney. If you take a whole section like this, we call that um, the renal lobe. And inside the renal lobe, there are a lot of nephrons. Each nephron consists of corpuscle and this whole long tubule. So corpuscle and tubule is a nephron and we have a lot of nephron. So here it is again, if you go layer by layer, the outermost, which is out here, the brown, this is the renal capsule. If you go to the next layer, this green right here, this will be the cortex. If you go more than that, you will have the medulla. Uh, if you look inside the, the, the medulla, it's divided into two parts, two components together, alternate, like this, these greens here. These are the pyramids. It actually looks like a pyramid. And in between each two successive pyramids, you have a column, which is this picture right here. Um, if you talk about this whole thing right here, you call that the renal sinus, which is all the cavities here. But uh, if you go in details, um, before you go to these cavities, here is one of these triangles or pyramids, uh, triangular shaped structures or pyramids. The tip of the pyramid is called papilla. So papilla is the tip of the pyramids. So inside these, inside the cortex and inside these pyramids, we make the urine that go to the papilla right here. And then it's going to open to the next structure, which is these uh, green cup shaped structures here that are called the renal calluses. The single is calyx. Calluses is plural. So minor calyx means the small cups, small cups, small cups, small cup, and so on. These small cups will come together to make bigger cups, which is called the major calluses. So this is a major calyx, this is a major calyx. There are uh, like three four major calluses. So the urine go from the, from the cortex and, and the medulla, specifically um, the pyramids, to the tip, which is papilla. Tip is projecting, or papilla is projecting into the minor calyx, to the major calyx. And then that will take you to the renal pelvis, which is right here and then we'll take you to the ureter and each ureter the two ureters are going to go to the urine in a bladder so that the urine uh, is going to be stored temporarily until it leaves outside through the urethra so this is the sequence and it's important to remember that sequence it go from all these nephrons inside the cortex and inside the medulla or the pyramids to the tip which is the papilla, to the minor calyx, to the major calyx, to the renal pelvis, to the ureter, to the bladder, to the urethra, to the outside. Uh, if you talk about one nephron, each one nephron, th there is about a million of these. And the nephron is, uh, is uh, defined as the, 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 the functional unit of the kidney. So the functional unit of the kidney is nephron. What's a nephron? The nephron is two parts together. The renal corpuscle, and the tubules. So this is the general structure that we will discuss in details. Renal corpuscle itself consists of two parts, glomerulus, which is this cluster or tuft of capillaries uh, through which the blood is going to enter to these capillaries or, or to, to the glomerulus. Uh, part of this blood is going to be filtered out, which is a f the first step toward the urine formation. A good part of the blood is going to be filtered out means it's going to leave the capillaries through the pores and it's going to leave that and we will discuss the details but the entrance how the blood entered to this tuft of capillaries it's through the afferent with a so afferent with a is what's accessing the glomerulus efferent with e just to remember it is the one that's exiting exit axis and exit axis exit What's entering is axis, afferent, arteriole. And then it go to the glomerulus, good part is going to be filtered out, and then the, the remaining part of the blood, the rest of the blood will go back or will leave the glomerulus through efferent, efferent exit. Surrounding that cluster of capillaries or tuft of capillaries, there is a capsule that's called glomerular or Bauman's capsule. Do not confuse that with the kidney capsule, the renal capsule. This is outside of the whole kidney. This is just outside 
of the glomerulus. So this is called glomerular or Bauman's capsule. And so uh, the, the whatever is, is filtered out of the glomerulus, it's going to be received at this capsule. So it's going to receive the filtrate. And remember, I'm saying filtrate so far. I didn't say urine yet because it's not urine. Uh, the filtrate is whatever is filtered the parts whatever the parts of the blood that's filtered out of the glomerulus and go to the capsule um, the filtrate contain good stuff and bad stuff basically anything that is small enough to leave the glomerulus through the glomerular pores is called the filtrate whether it is good or bad whether you need it or not anything it's all about the size anything that's small small enough Will be filtered out but don't worry we will deal with it later in the tubules this is in the filtrate we're talking about only the uh, i mean in the in the corpuscle we're talking about the filtrate only so it's not urine yet then it will go to the next part the next component the second component of the nephron which is the renal tubules the renal tubule as are extensions tubular extensions from the glomerular capsule and this is going to go all the way different parts until it go to the collecting ducts the collecting duct is going to collect several of these tubules you will see the picture um, so the filtrate is going to leave the capsule and go to different parts of the tubule the proximal one proximal means closer which is the one that's closer to uh, uh, the corpuscle is called proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal means close, closer, convoluted means uh, like folding, in folding shape. Uh, and then it will go to the nephron lobe, or also known as loop of Hanel, which is descending and ascending, and then it will go to the distal convoluted tubule. Until the distal convoluted tubule, this is the last part. The distal convoluted tubule is the last part of the renal tubule. E each group of these distal convoluted tubules are going to open into one collecting duct so the collecting duct is not part of the tubule uh, so the distal convoluted tubule is going to, um, to empty the collecting duct from the collecting duct it will pass through uh, st um, 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 at the collecting duct it will go through the medulla to the renal papilla which is the tip of the pyramids and it will go to the minor calyx what is going to the minor calyx it is the urine so the filtrate is what leave the glomerulus go to the Bauman's capsule and then it will go through the tubules as it is going through the tubules you will get back reabsorb the good stuff and you will get rid of the bad stuff so as you're going you're doing that over and over and over until you until the end which is the end of the collecting duct at the end of the collecting duct whatever is going to leave the collecting duct at the tip and go to the minor calyx this is the urine so from the, from the minor calyx all the way until you urinate outside, this is all urine. Uh, so here is the structure of the nephron again. Uh, this is one of the nephron. So this part right here is called the renal corpuscle, which is two parts. The outer part is the renal uh, capsule and the red inside is the glomerulus, this cluster of capillaries. Afferent arteriole is going to enter to the glomerulus part is going to filter out and then the rest will leave through the efferent and then the filtrate is going to go through a proximal convoluted tubule it's a tubule that's folding like this convoluted like this proximal means closer to the corpuscle and then descending loop of funnel ascending loop of funnel uh, distal convoluted tubule each group of distal convoluted tubule like one two three four five they will go to the collecting duct from the collecting duct at the tip of the pyramid it will go to the minor calyx so from this point from it the point it filters out into the capsule until it go to the end here this is all called filtrate as long as soon as it leave go to the minor calyx now you call it the urine this is a closer uh, uh, picture uh, here is blood entering through the afferent go to the glomerulus a good part is filtered out into capsular space right here which is inside the uh, this uh, nephron capsule or glomerular capsule and then the rest of the blood is going to leave through the efferent um, 
this is the capsule right here and this is another layer of the capsule on the capillaries uh, and inside in between those the cap uh, in between the glomerulus and the capsule this is called the capsular space in which the filtrate is going to collect and it will go to the proximal convoluted tubule so here it is this is the whole thing from afferent to the glomerulus uh, i mean uh, to the glomerulus filtrate goes out to the capsule uh, and then to the proximal convoluted tubule, to the descending loop of final, to the ascending, to the distal convoluted tubule, to the collecting duct, minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, ureter, bladder, urethra. This sequence is very important to remember. If you need to remember it, we can give you any part of those and ask you about uh, the correct sequence. So how the urine, felt, um, uh, urine formed? First of all, we have the glomerular filtration, which is whatever is filtered out of the glomerulus going to the Bauman's capsule or the nephron capsule. And again, this is called a filtrate. And as, uh, as uh, the filtrate is going through uh, the tubules, the different tubules, so let me go back to this one. So the filtrate is going to the proximal convoluted tubule, descending loop, ascending loop, distal, and so on. So as you're moving in these tubules, there is a reason that the filtrate go through all of this before go to the collecting ducts and go and become the urine. Why? Because you're doing two things here. As you're moving down, you are going to reabsorb, reabsorb means absorb again, the good stuff. What do you mean by the good stuff? Anything that the body still, need, still needs. And you're going to get rid of more of the bad stuff beside what was filtered out another you're getting rid of another part uh, of the bad stuff and we call that secretion so as the filtrate is moving down the tubules you are reabsorbing the good secreting the bad reabsorbing the good secreting the bad reabsorbing the good secreting the bad until you go to the minor calyx now nothing is going to change it's the urine already but before that you have these processes so it's called a tubular reabsorption, which is reabsorbing anything that you need. Of course, nutrients is one thing. You take it back to the bloodstream, and we call that tubular reabsorption. And the definitions here are extremely important, not only for the lecture, but also for the lab. Because I can show you like the, t the tubule, or even if I uh, describe it to you, and then you tell me what's happening here. So definitions are extremely important here. What's a glomerular filtration? Tubular reabsorption, this is what's reabsorbed, means absorbed again, you take it back from the tubules back to the bloodstream. Tubular secretion is the opposite. Anything that's bad, toxins and others, that's it's still in the blood, didn't go to the glomerulus, go to, didn't go to the filtrate, but you still have a good chance as, as the filtrate moving down the tubules to secrete another part of these toxins and bad stuff into the, f uh, the filtrate as it is moving. Now if you ask yourself why the, uh, uh, the blood is entering to the through, uh, the, um, um, th through the afferent arteriole and then go to the glomerulus and then leave through the efferent, why part of it is filtered out? Why it doesn't like enter and leave without part of it uh, filtering out? If I go back to this picture right here, it is the afferent the blood is moving in going to the glomerulus and it will go out here is the idea the blood as it is moving in there is a pressure that's coming from the heart the, the heart push the blood make pressure on the blood and the blood moved under pressure until it goes in the afferent and moves in so this is pushing part of the blood out so this is one of the forces that's pushing out and we call that the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. Is the cavity completely empty? Not necessarily. There is some filtrate in here. So there is another hydrostatic pressure in the cavity, but obviously the hydrostatic pressure inside is more and higher than the hydrostatic, uh, inside I mean the glomerulus, is higher than the tubular one. So the difference between those is called the net hydrostatic pressure, which is the difference between the hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus, which is high, and the uh, capsular space hydrostatic pressure or the capsular hydrostatic pressure which is less so obviously this will make the filtrate goes out but it's not that simple there is another force 
that participate in this process even though it's, this is uh, the main one but there is another force which is called the osmotic or the oncotic pressure remember this is not water it's blood so it is plasma so it is a solution so in the water parts of the plasma there are a lot of things in here which is the plasma proteins and the salt and different things so the osmotic pressure in here is different than the osmotic pressure also different than the osmotic pressure in the capsule so glomerular osmotic pressure or oncotic pressure is different than the capsular oncotic or osmotic pressure the glomerular is higher why because remember what is leaving which is a filtrate is anything that's small enough meaning what is small enough water is small enough um, something like salt is small enough ions are small enough uh, small nutrients like glucose amino acids and fatty acids these are all small enough toxins and waste products these are small enough but it's, so it's it's a lot of things but you can remember what is big is bigger than the pores that cannot leave that you cannot leave out of the glomerulus except if you have an injury which is not our issue now because we're talking about physiology not pathophysiology so under normal circumstances what cannot leave anything that's big meaning plasma proteins specifically albumin is too big to leave and also uh, plasma proteins in general is one thing and also the cells the cells are big enough that it cannot pass through so but the point I'm trying to make here is if the plasma proteins didn't leave and if the big stuff couldn't leave so the osmotic pressure inside the glomerulus is higher than the capsular and this is trying to suck in back to move the fluid back so you're talking about two forces now hydrostatic pressure that's favoring moving out net hydrostatic pressure and net oncotic that's trying to push back in but which one of those net forces is higher hydrostatic is higher so now the filtrate is going to leave out So here it is, net filtration pressure is the force favoring a filtration, which is hydrostatic pressure inside, and the force that's opposing that, which is hydrostatic pressure in the capsule, we call it the capsular. The net is in favor of leaving out, favor filtration. So glomerular hydrostatic pressure minus capsular hydrostatic pressure is the opposing force. Uh, I talked about the oncotic pressure, but now we, we, we have a filtrate that's leaving out. Um, how much of that filtrate is leaving? And what is the rate of filtration through the glomerulus? This is called glomerular filtration rate. And glomerular filtration rate is the rate of filtration through the glomerulus into the capsular space. And this can change, the rate can change uh, depending on different factors. If you increase the hydrostatic, hydrostatic pressure, obviously this is the main force for pushing the filtrate out. So if you increase the hydrostatic pressure in the, in the glomerulus, that will increase the rate. If you decrease it, that will decrease the rate. On the other side, you have the osmotic pressure, which is the opposite. So how to increase the glomerular filtration rate? Either increase the, the glomerular uh, hydrostatic pressure or decrease the glomerular osmotic pressure. Both of those and this is important to understand, both of those are going to uh, increase the glomerular filtration rate. So if you understand uh, that the net uh, hydrostatic is pushing out and the net oncotic is pushing back in, you can uh, understand exactly what are we talking about. Uh, so the question is, how does that happen? Um, well, to increase the glomerular hydrostatic pressure, simply make more blood goes in and less blood leaves. So the pressure is going to increase. Let me look at it here. If I dilate this afferent, more blood will enter. And if I constrict the, this efferent, so the blood is moving under high pressure, dilation, more blood is push, pushing in, and less is leaving. So there will be more pressure here, and glomerular filtration rate is going to increase. Or if you decrease the osmotic pressure here, how? Uh, whatever is happening, less plasma protein for some reason, uh, will also increase the glomerular filtration rate. Uh, so, think about it again. 
if I wanted to increase the glomerular filtration rate, what should I do? Dilate the afferent, constrict the efferent. More filtrate, increase glomerular filtration rate. How about if they do the opposite? If I constrict the afferent and dilate the efferent, efferent with E, less blood is, in, is entering and more is leaving. The pressure drops, less glomerular filtration rate. And the reason why I'm mentioning all of that is this is the main way to uh, control how much urine you're going to make and how much of filtrate you're going to make, which is going to be translated into urine. Meaning simply, um, if you wanted to preserve your blood, like you lost some blood for some reason, you have dehydration, or if you uh, have burn or whatever is happening that's giving you drop in the blood pressure, uh, you need to preserve your blood pressure. So what will happen here is the sympathetic nervous system will going to take the upper hand and this is what's going to dilate the, uh, the uh, I mean constrict the afferent and dilate the afferent. So now less blood is going to go in. So you're making less urine, you're increasing the blood pressure, which is what you need to do. Um, on the other hand, if you are in a parasympathetic situation, which is mainly like you're relaxing and uh, everything is okay, now it's a good time to make more urine and you can go to the bathroom. So now you can dilate the afferent and constrict the efferent. So this is for the glomerular filtration rate. This is just discussing the same thing. You have two forces opposing each other, hydrostatic pressure from one side and the uh, osmotic pressure on the other side. Uh, now the tubular reabsorption. Again, tubular reabsorption means the reabsorption in the tubules. This is where you reabsorb again. So here is the afferent artery. The blood is moving in, going to the glomerulus, and then it will leave through the efferent. But good part of it is going to be filtered out and go to the capillary space, as I mentioned before. And then the filtrate is going to move down. Uh, the first thing is the proximal convoluted tubule. And as it is going through the, 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 through, through the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, you're going to reabsorb good part of it. And it is important to remember that most of the tubular reabsorption, about 70% of the whole tubular reabsorption happen in the proximal convoluted tubule. The rest is going to happen in the rest of the tubules like the, the, the loop of fennel and the distal convoluted tubule and so on. But most of it is in the proximal. And also it's important to remember that all, all of organic nutrient reabsorption, reabsorption of organic nutrients like glucose, all of it should be reabsorbed uh, in a proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, re um, um, but uh, this is in a normal scenario. I mean, I'm not talking about somebody who's diabetic or something like that. I'm talking about normal physiology. So in normal physiology, 100% of the nutrients are going to be reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Meaning, when you leave the proximal going to the loop, you should not have any nutrients. And you should remember that. Uh, remember that the proximal convoluted tubules are lined by microvilli that um, it will take the nutrients and not just the nutrients, but other filtrate. It's going to, to take it from the lumen of, uh, of, the, of the tubule which contain the filtrate and it's going to take it out to these capillaries surrounding the, the tubule which is called the peritubular capillaries peri p-e-r-i means around tubules many tubular uh, peritubular capillaries means the capillaries surrounding the tubules so this is for this part uh, also some sodium and water reabsorption is going to happen in the proximal convoluted tubule and the opposite is tubular secretion which is the exactly the opposite of what we just mentioned which is if we go back to this again remember that you're going to take the good stuff from the tubular lumen which is from the filtrate to the peritubular capillaries which is going to ba go back to the blood so now you talk you talk your good stuff back and we call that tubular reabsorption on the other hand, as it is moving, why don't you take another patch of the bad stuff from the peritubular capillaries into the tubular lumen, so you're adding it 
to the filtrate and we call that secretion so we have two things happening at the same time inside the tubules reabsorption which is from the tubular lumen to the to the peritubular capillaries and secretion which is the bad stuff i say bad stuff means not only toxins it's whatever you don't need like if you have extra uh, potassium you will get rid of it if you have extra hydrogen toxins anything that you don't need will be secreted means it moved from the peritubular capillaries into the tubular lumen and it's going to join um, to the uh, filtrate so uh, usually you're going to reabsorb this is the what's usually happening uh, you're going to reabsorb what and secrete what I talked about the nutrients so I will talk I put it aside 100% in the proximal convoluted tubule under normal circumstances and normal physiology so this is one part it's done what else are you going to do you're going to reabsorb sodium and water and no this is normally it can change but I'm talking about normal physiology now normal composition so you're absorbing sodium and water and you're getting rid of potassium and hydrogen so this is happening in exchange take the so take your sodium and so here is the sodium moving in and potassium out sodium in potassium out when sodium is moving in uh, water is also moving in when potassium moves out hydrogen also moves out it just happened like this um, there are hormones that have effect on the urine volume they work on the different parts of the tubules AGH and aldosterone are two very important hormones that you need to remember so what's the ADH it's anti diuretic hormone or anti diuretic hormone the hormone that's against diuresis diuresis means a lot of urine diuresis many or a lot of urine it's against that meaning it reabsorb uh, water back so are you reabsorbing water back already yes but AGH is controlling the amount so it can tell you like absorb reabsorb more reabsorb less you're reabsorbing the water anyway it has to happen otherwise you will be making like a hundred liters of, of urine per day which doesn't happen why because you reabsorb 90 something percent of the water that goes through the tubular uh, uh, through the tubular lumen or through the tubules you're going to reabsorb 90 something close to 99 percent will go back under effect of what ADH so remember that if you have high ADH you make less urine why because ADH will make you reabsorb more water if you have low ADH you're going to reabsorb less water so more water will be lost so the urine will be diluted and a lot so you need to remember this high ADH less urine that's concentrated low ADH uh, high volume of urine that's diluted so the bottom line is ADH and the most important to remember ADH is responsible for what water reabsorption water reabsorption reabsorption of water it's important to remember where which part like here is the glomerulus this is the capsule proximal convoluted tubule descending loop of fennel ascending loop this is the thin part still ascending loop which is a thick part distal convoluted tubule collecting that which of all of this does ADH work it work on the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts the last two and it is very important to remember that where ADH work distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct uh, aldosterone on the other hand it reabsorbs sodium in those two same spots but it reabsorbs sodium so ADH reabsorb water and aldosterone reabsorb sodium um, uh, uh, how about the, the this loop of fennel remember loop of fennel is mainly for water reabsorption there is a process here that's called the counter current effect which is you're making the medullary interstitial fluid more hypertonic to help the water moves easily out of the loop of funnel and it goes back 
so you're reabsorbing the water back through this mechanism. Uh, the next part is going to be the ureters, and the ureters are going to start from here, from the renal pelvis, uh, and it go all the way until it enter into the bladder. Um, you need just to remember that when the ureter enter the bladder, um, it, 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 there is a part that's like slit-like. The last part is slit-like. The muscles of the bladder are going to push on the end of the ureter as it's entering to the bladder to make some sort of a valve or a sphincter so that when the urine moves from the ureter into the bladder, it doesn't go backwards. And if it goes backward, this is, will be an issue. Next part is the urinary bladder, and urinary bladder is a muscular organ, a hollow muscular organ that's distendable, means it can distend to double uh, and in, um, uh, it's, it's um, or even more than that, uh, to increase its uh, the volume that it can store. It's basically for storage of the urine. It can di distend and dilate uh, temporarily. Uh, there is a triangle inside the bladder that you need to remember, and this is called a trigone. Trigone means uh, the three spots or the three borders. Trigone. And this trigone is bounded by two of the three points is the two ureters, the opening of the, three ure of the two ureters, and the third one is the urethra. So if you connect these three dots, like it is uh, ureter, another ureter, urethra, you're going to make a triangle and you call that the trigon. If you talk about the wall of the bladder, it consists of three, three layers. The innermost is called the mucus uh, membrane or the inner mucus. And it is important here to remember that this type is called transitional epithelium. So the inner lining is transitional epithelium. Why did you call it transitional? Because it makes transitions. The shape change from one shape to the other shape. The epithelium change in the shape. Because when you distend, it looks different. So it allow the distension of the, of the bladder. And then you have submucosa, and then muscular, muscular layer, and then cirrhosis at the end. It's important to remember that this muscular layer it is, is called detrosor muscle. This name is very important to remember. What is this strong muscle that if contract, it's pushing the urine out of the bladder going into the urethra. This is called detrosor muscle. It's a very strong, smooth muscle. Um, part of this uh, detrosor muscle, the part that's in the neck of the bladder, this is called internal urethral sphincter. Uh, internal urethral sphincter is involuntary. And the clue to remember this is the N goes with the N. Any, any time, take it as a rule. Anytime you have a sphincter, the internal will be involuntary. Internal, involuntary. So obviously the external is going to be voluntary. So this is something that will help you remember. Internal, involuntary. External is voluntary. You have an external sphincter, and this is the one that you voluntarily relax in order to void or urinate. So if you look at this picture right here, this is giving you the different parts. Inside here, this is the detrosor muscle, this is the trigone, this is one border which is the opening of the ureter, another opening, another ureter, po uh, opening of the ureter, and the third one is for the urethra right here. Um, so this is, um, uh, these, uh, these folds inside the bladder are called the rogues, and the sphincter right here at the neck is the internal urethral sphincter, and this is the one that's involuntary, you do not have a control over it, when the, the bladder is full, it's going to open anyway. But the, 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 the urine is not going to leave because you have an external one that's under your control. Obviously, the urethra that's coming uh, is longer in males uh, and it consists of three parts that we will discuss. The first part here is inside the prostate. So it's right from the internal sphincter passing through the prostate. So we call it prostatic urethra. The second one is in so the second part is a tiny part that's inside this membrane right here, which is the urogenital diaphragm. But what we call this part of the urethra, membranous urethra, the part of the urethra that's inside the membrane. The last part, which is the longest part, is the part that's running within the penis, and we call it penile urethra. To be more specific, it runs in the spongy part. So we also call it spongy urethra. Penile or spongy is the same thing. But as you see here, 
the, the urethra in males is like three, four times as long as males. And this is one of the reasons why females get more urinary tract infection or cystitis than males. Because it's very easy for the microorganisms or the pathogens to just travel this small distance, short distance, enter in. It doesn't have to go through all of this long urethra. This is one of the reasons. The other reason is that the opening here at the tip here of the penis that's far away uh, from the rest of the organ surrounding it. Uh, but in females, the opening is very close to the surrounding uh, openings and, or and, and other organs like uh, the, the anal opening or the anus and so on. So there are a lot of pathogens surrounding it. So there are two reasons why females uh, get more uh, urinary tract infection than males. So here is the urethra. Obviously, in, in females, is a lot shorter. And in males, three parts, as I mentioned, prostatic, membranous, and penile. Um, and I explained it why uh, more um, uh, urinary tract infection is more in females. Um, but uh, it's also important to remember there is an external sphincter out here. The external sphincter in males is inside the membrane. In females, it's inside the membrane as well, but it's right here. Uh, but it's, it's important to remember that external is voluntary. Uh, internal is involuntary. Internal is involuntary. Why? Because it is smooth muscles. And smooth muscles obviously do not have control over your smooth muscles. Um, the skeletal muscles, it's something similar to the muscles attached to your skeleton. Like, it's, it's not exactly, but it's similar. The same muscle fibers as the muscle fibers in your skeleton, like biceps and triceps and all that. So obviously being skeletal muscles that explain why it is a voluntary muscle. So what's happening here is if micturation reflex, how micturation happen, just to make it simple, when the bladder is full, the internal is involuntary, so it's going to open anyway. So the urine is going to try to leave, but the external is closed. So once the urine, uh, the internal open, the external, there is a reflex that will make the external close. So the urine does not leave, except when it is, um, uh, when it is suitable for you to go to the bathroom and urinate. Now you have to voluntarily uh, relax the external one, and this is where you can void or micturate or urinate. So uh, just to make it simple, the reflex is, bladder is full or close to be full and internal uh, open and the external close at the same time who is doing this it's the micturition reflex it go to the sacrum to the sacral plexus and it goes back through the so the the when the internal open a signal go through an afferent to the sacral plexus which is the nervous part of the nervous system in the sacral region and then the afferent will go back to the external to close it. So you open the internal, you close the external at the same time. Or the external close immediately after the internal open, thanks to that reflex in the sac uh, that's mediated through the sacral nervous uh, part of the nervous system that does that for us. So um, the, the last point is you're going to relax the external so now you can void the urine out. And this is for the urethra and the maturation reflex.